Chicago. He uh, has published a great deal. We don't want to spend a lot of time on his academic accomplishments, which are significant. He did train with Al Winnie. Uh, but just a couple of interesting notes. He is from this area. He grew up in Jersey, uh, went to a New York Medical uh, College, and also trained uh, here in the city, and also actually worked at the hospital. The other interesting thing to know about Dr. Candido that is he really truly is an athlete. Uh, I'll tell you one personal uh, story is that my, when I first met him, we were out with, with one of my Hopkins colleagues. We're playing two and two basketball. We were 40. I thought that was a friendly game, but it was quite rough. I was in the early times. And I had to step out for a second uh, to see a colleague, and none of my Hopkins uh, colleagues stepped in. And next thing you know, when I come back, this guy's holding a bloody nose. So, and just to give you a uh, Now, this is amazing. So, this is the only video introduction I'll ever give anyone. So, this is Ken, and you can see he is in great shape. He was on the Rutgers football team. He was, all, he was a quarterback. You see the, bas the basket right there. Objectives, we have to do that for the purposes of continuing medical education. We'll define terms such as neuropathy. We'll talk about the four cardinal features of peripheral neuropathy. Most of you are quite familiar with those already. And we'll talk a little bit about the medical and legal consequences of providing regional anesthesia to individuals who have pre existing neuropathies. Because, after all, at the end of the day, we want to keep our patients safe first and foremost. First, do no harm. And we'll hopefully develop, when we finish here today, some strategies to deal with the compromised patients who, prevent, who present with regional anesthesia. Now, how many of the residents and how many of the fellows are familiar with the ASRA guidelines for how to provide regional anesthesia to the patient with pre-existing neuropathy? By a show of hands, how many have read those guidelines? 
Anybody else? Just one? <coughs> Who's read the ASRA guidelines for how to manage a patient with pre-existing neuropathy? Well, actually, there are no guidelines. <laughs> how to manage a patient. That was a trick question. I'm, I apologize. That's a Chicago thing. Uh, there are no guidelines for how to manage the patient who has a pre-existing neuropathy who comes to you for a regional anesthesia. A little bit of a historical vignette. I had the privilege, and uh, Dr. Wu pointed this out, I was trained by the great professor, Alan Winnie. He was a great friend of uh, Bill Ermey in your department and, and helped uh, Bill, and Bill helped him as well in many uh, publications and presentations. Um, in 1975, these five individuals got together and created the renovated or resurgence of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. And except for Harold Carr, who passed in 1991, the others had a very long and distinguished careers. But it was troubling to me recently, on, on August 1st of last year, when uh, Don Breidenbaugh passed, to realize suddenly that all the founding fathers of Azra are now dead. So we're going through a transitionary phase uh, of, of sorts in regional anesthesia. The great leaders, the people who brought together uh, a whole group of like-minded individuals who had as a foundation, an interest in regional anesthesia, they've all passed. And I want to spend just a few seconds talking about a couple of them. Jordy Katz, who passed in 14, Don Breidenbaugh, who passed August 1st of last year, and my mentor, Alan Winnie, who was uh, the first president of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, one of the founding fathers, he passed in 15. Prithvi Raj, who was also a founding father of Azra, passed in 16. And then there were other, two other individuals who were extraordinarily influential in regional anesthesia, but who were not you know, either on the board of directors or founding fathers. That would be Danny Moore from the Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle and Phil Bromish, both of whom were Gaston Labatt Award winners. Those of you who know your, your own Nigel Chirac won this distinguished award in 2017. It's, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the award just, just for a moment as well. So Alan Witte was notable because he talked about neuropathy in pre-existing patients, uh, uh, pre-existing neuropathy in patients coming from regional anesthesia. In 1983, he wrote his classic monograph dedicated exclusively to plexus anesthesia, which I was actually consigned to, to do again, but I thought about it. And those of you who know the history of regional anesthesia textbooks might recall that Gaston Labatt wrote two editions of his famous uh, regional anesthesia book, one in 1922, one in 1928. And then in about 1955, John Adriana down in Louisiana, uh, in Louisiana was supposed to write the third edition. And it took him 20 years. And at the end, it never was the same. And when Alan had asked me to help rewrite this, I thought, you know, some things are just better left uh, alone. One single edition, one single volume, one single time for all time. And that's really how I look upon this great seminal work. He was the first president of Azra. You can see him here. He actually worked from a wheelchair because he was stricken with polio at the age of 28 while he was an intern at Cook County Hospital. And one of the amazing things to me about Alan Winnie was his incredible insight and his foresight. And in 1977, Alan Winnie laid down eight postulates of regional anesthesia. He hypothesized or opined that regional anesthesia would provide superior analgesia to general anesthesia, improve rehabilitation efforts, decrease perioperative nausea, vomiting, cause the patients to emerge faster, recover quicker. Because the blocks were unilateral, the patients, uh, compared to spinal or epidurals, patients would have earlier mobilization. Because the blocks were unilateral and postganglionic, there would be less derangements of the sympathetic nervous system compared to spinal and epidural. Outpatient discharges would be faster, and there would be extended benefits to be accrued by the use of continuous catheters. Now, this was Winnie's postulates in 1977 without a shred of scientific evidence to support them. And as we're all very much well aware in this room, each of these postulates has come to fruition. And that was the mindset of the great leaders of regional anesthesia back in the day. They knew things that, that they ultimately hadn't proven, but which they knew would be proved. And I, I considered Alan a friend, as Bill Irby did as well. He was also a, not just a colleague, he was a professional father to myself. Now, another in interesting individual in regional anesthesia who recently passed was Danny Moore. Danny Moore was not a board of director uh, as a member, but he was a Gaston Labatt winner. And Daniel was unique because in the 1950s, he wrote four textbooks dedicated to regional anesthesia. One was called Regional Block. One was called Complications in Regional Anesthesia. One was called Obstetric Anesthesia. 
and the other one was dedicated to Stelle Ganglion Block. And it was really an amazing compendium and, and compilation by a single editor and single author to put together these, these works. And Daniel passed in 2015 at the age of 96. The reason he's an important figure in this discussion today is because he was the first individual in print to talk about regional anesthesia in the patient with a pre-existing neuropathic pain condition and neuropathy. The other great individual who also passed within the last five, six years was Phil Bromage. Most of you know about the Bromage scale, uh, assessing motor function after epidural analgesia and anesthesia. And Phil was also a unique character. In 1978, he wrote a treatise dedicated to epidural analgesia. And this, this was a book where he was the first to describe in print the neurological considerations and complications associated with epidural block in patients with pre-existing <coughs> neurological conditions. Then there was P. Prithvi Raj, another founding father of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, who also passed in 2016. You see on the left side, uh, myself and with Dr. Winnie and Raj in 2002, and then in 2012, 12, uh, 10 years later. And Raj was very instrumental in talking about not just regional anesthesia, but interventional pain management and the constraints imposed upon providing that type of process for patients who have pre-existing neuropathic pain conditions. It's a talk, within a talk, I'm going to talk about patients with pre-existing neuropathy. The first thing we must do, of course, is to define neuropathy, the four cardinal patterns of peripheral neuropathy, which include a polyneuropathy, mononeuropathy, mononeuritis multiplex, and autonomic neuropathy. So what are those conditions? Well, polyneuropathy is a generalized disorder. We see this, for example, with individuals with long-standing diabetes, uh, diabetes mellitus. Mononeuropathy is a disease process or an entity <coughs> affecting a single nerve, where would we see that? Well, we could see that in diabetes, but more typically we see that in a condition, let's say, such as piriformis syndrome, where the sciatic nerve is uniquely compressed uh, between the two heads and two bellies of the piriformis muscle. Mononeuritis multiplex is inflammation of several separate nerves in unrelated parts of the body. You could see this in diabetes or amyloidosis or in systemic lupus erythematosus and autonomic neuropathy. And we see this in conditions such as shy drager syndrome, it's a, it's a collection of syndromes and diseases which are affecting the autonomic nervous system and hence causing either derangements of the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous systems or both. Now, pre-existing neuropathic conditions are heterogeneous, they're not homogeneous, and henceforth they're very difficult to classify and to pin down, which is why we don't have good guidelines about how to manage patients who come to us for regional anesthesia. There are 21 separate and distinct conditions of neuropathy that we could discuss today, but in the interest of time and getting you all safely to the OR, we'll just talk about a couple of these, because you may see these and you do see these each and every day, and whether or not you recognize them or not is something else. But patients who've got diabetes will have neuropathic conditions. I'll be alcoholic, renal failure patient. I'm gonna talk a little bit about hereditary conditions, because many of us are not quite familiar or readily familiar with things like HNPP. Hereditary neuropathy with a liability for pressure palsies or Charcot-Marie tooth disorder, which is actually the most common condition of a genetic nature where there's a, a neuropathic process. Toxins, chemotherapeutic agents, multiple sclerosis, which affects the central and not the peripheral nervous system. We'll talk a little bit about Charcot-Marie Tooth and some of the entrapment syndromes. So we can divide these types of neuropathic pain conditions into those which are central and those which are peripheral. And today we'll spend a little bit of time talking about multiple sclerosis and those patients who present for regional anesthesia. And then the peripheral pain conditions, we'll talk about the hereditary neuropathies, as I just alluded to, some of the toxic chemotherapy-induced neuropathies and what the implications are for those patients who present to us for regional anesthesia and some of the entrapment neuropathies as well. Now, we all know that this is a, a, a truism that we must adhere to and uphold what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So I'm not saying I was or was not in Las Vegas this past weekend. And I don't know if any of you were or were not in Las Vegas last weekend, but if you were, you might have seen that Joe Neal received the Distinguished Gaston Labatt Award. And I want to spend just a, a few seconds because uh, Professor Chirac has also won this Distinguished Award two years ago. And this is given to the individual who has made unique contributions throughout his or her career dedicated to regional anesthesia and pain management. Well, who was Gaston Labat? Gaston Labat was from the Seychelles Islands. He trained in Montpellier, France. 
And in about 1920, when Willie, William Mayo from the Mayo Clinic had come to Paris to observe some surgical procedures in the operating theater, he realized that there was this young upstart uh, named Gaston Labatt who was very uniquely talented at performing regional analgesia. He recruited Labatt to come to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And so Labatt, who was married, promptly left his wife and came out with his girlfriend and hung out at the Mayo Clinic. And he was supposed to be at the Mayo for four weeks, but ended up staying for almost a year before coming here to New York to Bellevue Hospital. But while he was at the Mayo Clinic, Bill Mayo, who was obviously a very gifted surgeon, especially with abdominal procedures, suggested that Labatt write a textbook of regional anesthesia to describe these novel, wonderful approaches. And if you look here carefully, you'll see that the publication date of Labatt's first uh, uh, book, Regional Anesthesia, was 1922. And there were 315 illustrations. His second textbook was 1928. And it was updated, again, with a foreword from William Mayo. And I happen to be privileged to own multiple copies of both of these editions. They're very, very, very hard to find. And so we give tremendous credit to Gaston Labatt for be basically being the father of modern regional anesthesia. Would that be true? Anybody have any qualms with that? I guess as Ronald Reagan stated, there's no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. And so in reality, Labatt stole or plagiarized 73% of his book directly from Victor Pauche, who was his mentor. And Pauche in 1914 wrote the first edition, L'Anesthesia Regionale in French, and then in 1917, wrote the second edition. I happened to find this book, which is extraordinarily difficult to find. I found it in Paris and purchased it for a mere 500 euros. And that was actually a bargain because you can't get this book. And I went back and I looked. In 2002, Douglas Bacon and Terry Horlocker did a comparison head to head between Pauchet's book and Labatt's book and found that Labatt had directly stolen 73.3% of his work, including the exact same table of contents from Victor Pauche, never gave Pauche any credit. So in reality, we pay homage to people who have made a big noise in regional anesthesia. We do that. For example, in this great city, we, have, we pay homage to people who've created the New York School of Regional Anesthesia, for example. But let me tell you a little bit. I'm a little bit older than almost everybody in the room, and this hospital is famous. But before 1987, all you had was a three-in-one block. You gave pentanol, a pentothal, succinylcholine, and endotracheal tube. That was how regional anesthesia was conducted at the hospital for special surgery. And it took the insight of one great leader or one great th thinker who really is the, the pauché of regional anesthesia in the city. And so, Professor uh, Chirac, I salute you for having had the insight and not having to toot your own horn and go around and, and create pathways and, and create meetings and, and websites and call yourself the New York School of Regional Anesthesia, but that's really where it all started. It started right here at the Hospital for Special Surgery, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it. And so it's sometimes, often, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, but in, in, in reality, we know who the great leaders and thinkers are who've created the pathways that we all adhere to and follow. So for patients with peripheral neuropathic disease who actually come to us for regional anesthesia, what is our framework? Do we have guidelines for how to manage those patients? In fact, we do not. And we have to go back to regional anesthesia textbooks. So after Labatt and Pauche, there was a period of a lag period until the next great reference work came forward about regional block, and that was published by Danny Moore, a single editor, single author, and really a heroic piece of work. And within a two-year period, Danny Moore wrote four textbooks, as I've already told you. And 1953 was a very, very important time in regional anesthesia. Does anybody know why? Besides the fact that Danny Moore wrote his first book. It was 514 pages long and had only one paragraph dedicated to patients with pre-existing neuropathic conditions. Well, 1953 was very important because that's when the trial was in London for the Woolley and Rowe cases. Does anybody, any, any of the fellows know who Woolley and Rowe were? Have you ever heard those names? So in 1947, Albert Woolley and Cecil Rowe came into the same institution, the Chesterfield Royal Hospital, for minor surgical procedures. One was a metastectomy, one was a hydroselectomy, and they both received spinal anesthetics with nuprocaine by Dr. Malcolm Graham. And they both ended up with painful spastic paracresis. paracresis. So they were paralyzed from spinal anesthetics. 
And this was a huge deal, not just in the United Kingdom, but worldwide. In fact, the use of neuraxial blocks and spinal anesthetics almost came to a complete cessation based upon these cases. And it was left to the great Sir Robert McIntosh, another great figure in regional anesthesia, to come and opine on behalf of the defense that this was not the fault of Dr. Graham at all, but actually during the sterilization process, the small ampules of chinchicane or nuprocaine were actually submersed in phenol. Phenol is a neurotoxic chemical. And the phenol egressed into the, into the local anesthetic, and when Graham injected it, he paralyzed the patients. But of course, that was probably just a fanciful hypothesis by McIntosh. And in reality, the needles themselves were placed in an acid descaler and where they were insufficiently washed off before being used by Graham, and that's probably what led to this outcome. And so, Woolley and Rowe case was really one of the first medical legal challenges to regional anesthesia. I happened to go through historical references, and I found one picture of Woolley and Rowe in the recovery room immediately after their spinal anesthetics, and I would like to share it with you. So there's Woolley, <laughs> and there's Rowe, and they're having this, they think that the spinal's gonna wear off any minute, right? Woolley says to Rowe, once the spinal wears up, I'm going to start training again. So we see that Danny Moore was the first individual to ever describe regional anesthesia in the patient with a pre-existing neuropathic pain condition, but he did so in 53 from the standpoint of looking at the medical legal consequences of what happens to patients when there's an aberrant or, or poor outcome associated with regional techniques. Whenever pre-existing neurological disorders are present, the possibility of a medical legal suit should be evaluated before administering a spinal caudal, epidural, or nerve block. 25 years went by before the next mention occurs of the patient with a pre-existing neuro neurological condition coming for regional, and that was by Phil Bromage in his seminal work called Epidural Analgesia from 1978. Any post-operative neurological complications arising after regional are likely to be attributed to the anesthetic. The nerve blocking effects of subarachnoid and epidural anesthesia are so dramatic that it is perhaps natural to propose an etiology based on shallow assumptions of cause and effect. Bromage was extraordinarily articulate, if you didn't get that from listening. And here's Bromage's book, very, very famous book, and I encourage you all to look it up and read it. It was really a heroic, single author, single editor attempt at writing. And again, in his 746 pages, he talks about neurological injury in eight pages, but spends only one paragraph talking about the patient with a pre-existing neurological condition. He further opines, although it's difficult to see how an epidural block could have an adverse effect on these conditions, those conditions being pre-existing neurological ones, the anesthesiologist will avoid the, uh, avoid the possibility of becoming involved in a post hoc ergo propter hoc litigation claim should a natural exacerbation of disease develop after the operation. Then 22 years went by uh, before another Labatt winner, this is Brendan Finucan, well known to those in the Azure circles, wrote his seminal work, Complications of Regional Anesthesia, and he also wrote an updated version of this in 2007, uh, 2007, and he dedicates 12 pages to neurological complications, but only two paragraphs to how to manage the patient who's got a pre-existing neurological problem who comes for regional anesthesia. And what does Finucane say about how to manage those patients? Well, he says that there's a dearth of information which makes it impossible to define specific guidelines. Going back in 99, 20 years ago, Fanukin knew we could not have specific guidelines for managing the patient who comes to us for regional block who has a neuromuscular disease, although it's clear that in many of these conditions, regional is actually the preferred, preferred technique for how to manage their anesthetics. In his second edition, Fanukin says, however, a study of significant size to confirm or support the safety of regional in these patients continues to remain scarce. The next, and this is Brendan Finucane with Professor Winnie and myself in 2007. In seven, and then again in 12, Joe Neal, the most recent Labatt Award recipient, and Jim Rathbone, who's another Labatt Award recipient, wrote Complications in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. It's a 386-page uh, treatise for which they dedicate one entire paragraph to how to manage the patient with pre-existing neuropathic conditions. And what do they say? However, it's also been suggested that patients with pre-existing neurological deficits may be at increased risk as well. Just a hypothesis. The presence of chronic underlying neural compromise, secondary to mechanical, ischemic, toxic, or metabolic derangements may place these reasons at increased risk. Notice the language in all of these books. There's a lot of dancing about the topic. 
And people use terms like it may be or it has been suggested, but there's nothing definitive at all in any of these published treatises about how to manage the patient with a pre-existing neurological condition. I will give credit to Neil and Rathbone. They <coughs> relied upon this schema that came out of a Jim Hebel publication that defined and described the so-called double crush phenomenon. Now, a double crush phenomenon is well known to all of us in this room. You can have a patient who comes in for a carpal tunnel surgery who's also got a cervical radiculopathy. There's double crushing of those nerves from the brachial plexus and the peripheral nerves, the median nerves. That's a double crush phenomenon. But in terms of neuropathic pain conditions and regional block, we consider a double crush to be the patient's underlying medical condition. So for example, in C here, the patient may have a peripheral neuropathic mononeuropathy due to some type of compressive process. And then they undergo a regional block where there's a second insult applied to the same nerve. That's a double crush phenomenon. And so Terry Horlocker, also from the Mayo Clinic, where Hebel is, wrote the, the next iteration of how to manage the patient with a pre-existing neuropathic pain condition. This was in 09, and again, it's a large reference work, 1,300 pages, and there's only 1.5 pages devoted to how to manage patients with neurological complications. And Horlocker's <coughs> opinion, again, is to be conservative. It's interesting, I just heard Sandy Kopp at Azra in Las Vegas this past weekend I'm not saying that I was in Vegas, but if I had been in Vegas, I think Cobb said the same thing. That the most conservative legal approach is to avoid regional anesthesia in these patients. Avoiding regional anesthesia from the Mayo Clinic. The decision to proceed with regional anesthesia in these patients is high risk, and it should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. So we look at 100 years of amazing reference works in our domain, the domain that we all practice each and every day, regional anesthesia. And if we look at the great authors that have come before us and the, and the great minds that have been put on this topic, there's almost 5,000 pages of written material of which there are five pages only and exclusively dedicated to how to look at the patient with a pre-existing neuropathic condition. And again, there are no guidelines. There's no guidelines. This is an unmet need. And for the inquiring minds and an audience such as this at HSS, I would expect somebody to probably write these guidelines within the next two to five years. There's no guidelines in the literature for how to manage patients who come to us who need regional anesthesia or for whom we suspect regional anesthesia could be beneficial and they have pre-existing neuropathies. There's nothing in textbooks and there's nothing from our great societies, including the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. We are silent on the issue. We're silent because we fear the repercussions of medical legal consequences associated with anesthetizing these patients. So what do we do? What are my suggestions? And I'm just a humble pain doctor out in the, the city of Chicago. I haven't done as much regional anesthesia in the last couple of years as I would have liked to. But we, we should conduct a neurological examination on all of our patients who present for us, even if we don't suspect that they have an underlying neuropathic condition. And we should, if we have a pre-anesthetic clinic as we do, I train my residents in the art of doing a neurological assessment, check their motor and sensory function, look at their pre existing medical records, whether they've had electromyography, nerve conduction velocity studies, MRIs, and so forth, and assess their exercise tolerance because these patients who've got autonomic neuropathy often have dysfunctional exercise tolerance. They certainly don't throw footballs 50 yards into a basketball hoop on the front lawn, but most of them don't anyway. And look at their volume status, their beat-to-beat -beat variability, resting tachycardia, the presence of orthostatic hypotension, table tilt tests, cardiac dysrhythmia is an impotence. Now, do we do a good job doing that? Well, the folks right here in this building conducted assessments as to the fact that we do not do a good job assessing patients, and this, thanks to Greg and Mary, amongst others, and Ricky Brill, for having looked at this. So do we do the appropriate amount of work to get the preoperative informed consent process for patients who come to us for regional anesthesia? I'm not talking about those with pre-existing neuropathies, all patients. It seems that most academic anesthesiologists who specialize in regional are actually unable to provide patients with the actual substantive risks of what regional anesthesia entails. And this is just in non-neurologically impaired individuals. Well, certainly places like Azra have the answer. And again, Ricky and Greg and others have looked at this. They sent out a survey monkey. 4,000 members of Azra got the survey. And as is usual in these circumstances, only 20% of people even responded even took the time to look at it. And it appears that the likelihood of disclosing the pertinent risks associated with regional was inconsistent. Inconsistent. We're not doing this. One out of five people answered. 
and those that answered are probably the ones who are doing it, but under ideal circumstances, most anesthesiologists are either not cognizant of the risks or do not discuss the risks of regional at all with our patients. Here's one of the unsung heroes in regional. This is Ricky Brull. I'm not saying I saw him in Vegas this past weekend, but if I did, this is what it would have looked like. And Ricky has actually done a, a yeoman's job. He's unsung because he's probably not going to win the Labatt Award and probably not going to be on anyone's poster. As a, but he's done some great, great heroic things in regional. This is one of his greatest contributions was in 07, he looked at 10 years worth of published data about the incidence of neurological injury following regional block, more than a million patients and thousands and thousands of studies. And he came forth with these numbers. Now what do these numbers mean? We don't really know because Ricky and his colleagues and Vincent Chan didn't sit down and say, well, how many of these patients had pre-existing neuropathic conditions? We don't know. He merely came with the published incidence of what uh, post-operative complications looked like in patients having regional. So for spinal, it's about four in 10,000. For epidural, it's two in 10,000. Those are pretty low numbers. They're low numbers, but the consequences of an adverse outcome with a spinal or an epidural may be catastrophic, long-lasting, and even lifelong lasting. Whereas the peripheral nerve blocks, we see about three in 100 for interscaling block, one and a half for axillary block, and maybe uh, one in 300 for femoral block. These are typically neuropraxias, which typically but not always resolved. And so, why do some patients, uh, why are some patients predisposed to neuropathic conditions? And why do some people with neuropathic conditions have longer standing adverse outcomes after regional block? This was left to Quinn Hogan to dissect. He's uh, from the Medical College of Wisconsin. He wrote some great papers. Here's one from 2008. He's also a Gaston Labatt Award winner from 2009. And Hogan talked about the, suscept the susceptibility of peripheral nerves. He was a microanatomist, and he looked at the microvascular blood flow to nerves as well as what factors cause ischemia in patients at risk. And Hogan said that the toxicity of injected anesthetics is proportional to the duration of exposure of the nerve to those anesthetics. In addition, there are agent-specific alterations in peripheral blood flow. We know that some local anesthetics are intrinsic vasodilators, and some local anesthetics have intrinsic vasoconstrictor properties. But Hogan was quick to, to point out the fact that we've often implicated epinephrine in patients uh, who have sustained post-operative neuropraxias or nerve injuries, but we ought not to because it's not likely that epinephrine is the primary offending agent. And so Hogan stated that local anesthetic-induced ischemia and toxicity is possible as well as me is mechanical trauma when we perform our regional anesthetic techniques. An ischemic insult causes ongoing depolarization of nerves, which causes increased spontaneous neural activity. And as in our tourniquets, and we all know from doing these cases with our orthopedic colleagues, we try to limit tourniquet inflation time <coughs> and pressures to two hours or less. But greater than two hours of ischemic time of the nerve in proximity to the local anesthetic, uh, if we can do so, we typically have a recovery of a dysfunctional nerve by six hours. So what about when, lo when local anesthetics stay closer to the nerve or in contact or communication with the nerve for more than two hours or six hours? Is there a condition where that occurs in common clinical practice? Well, here's a chemical agent, a liposomal preparation of a well-known local anesthetic that's been around for 50 years, Bupivacaine. And recently, last year, in fact, the United States Food and Drug Administration agreed that this drug would be acceptable for interscaling block and brachial plexus. And was there any data to support the likelihood that this drug was not more or less toxic than any other preparations of either Bupivacaine or other local anesthetics? Well, the only study which had been conducted to date was just published last, uh, this last month, in March of 2019, in the British Journal. And this was by Professor Admir Hadzik and his colleagues who looked at 12 pigs, and they injected these 12 pigs with intrathecal preparations of Exparel, and then they, they uh, uh, vivisectioned the spinal uh, columns of all of the pigs and found that there were no morphological changes at four weeks and six weeks and eight weeks in, in pigs, at least, who had received Exparel. Well, we, we're not really sure what the human condition is. It's difficult to extrapolate whether a study such as this, preliminary data, can be extrapolated to the human condition, and would we be using a drug like this in a patient with a pre-existing neuropathic pain condition? 
So what are the factors which do contribute to nerve injury? Well, there are neuraxial injuries and there are also peripheral inju injuries. And we can have things like mechanical damage, neural ischemia, or local anesthetic toxicity. We've already described some of these. For the peripheral injuries, there are patient-related factors, pre-existing neuropathic pain conditions, diabetes, amyloidosis, systemic lupus, erythematosus, hereditary conditions, uh, chemotherapy-induced processes. So these are pre-existing factors that our patients bring to us, and the presence of comorbidities, hypertension, smoking, body habitus, morbid obesity. There are also surgically related factors, patient positioning, stretch on exposed nerves, inability for the patient to move if they're having some kind of type of discomfort when they're uh, deeply sedated, stretch injuries, and anesthetic related factors, immobility and so forth. And so my only, my only single contribution to this entire controversy would be my one paper published now about 14 years ago in anesthesia and analgesia where we conducted, actually I performed every one of these injections. These were 700 consecutive interscaling blocks of the brachial plexus. And we conducted preoperative neurological assessments on all of these patients who came for shoulder surgery. And then we assessed all of these patients, we, had, we lost some to follow, for up to one year to determine whether or not individuals had neuropathy after surgery. And of these 700 patients, of which we ultimately had 693, we had 58 incidences of neuropathic pain following and neuropathy, including two brachial plexopathies following these ISVs. But in all cases, there was resolution except for those two brachial plexopathies. And in all cases, we found that the interscaling block of the brachial plexus was not the implicated factor for why patients developed a neuropathy. It was usually surgical positioning and it was usually pre-existing patient conditions. And this is my one single contribution. Well, obviously now, in my, in my study, all 700 blocks were done under uh, uh, the use of peripheral neural stimulation only. We, we're not using, I was not using ultrasound back in 2003 and 2004 when I conducted that study. And now, of course, we know that ultrasound prevents nerve injury, right? Everyone knows that we can see what's right in front of us, and we use ultrasound, and none of our patients develop a neuropathic process. So this is from Brian Seitz. We congratulate Brian, who has just now become the new editor-in-chief of the journal Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine. And Brian actually had a case of severe brachial plexopathy following an interscaling block of the brachial plexus with ultrasound guidance. And upon this case, because it was confusing and confounding, he didn't see that there had been any intraneural injection. There were opinions from noted authorities, including Alain Borgia, who was also last year's Gaston Labat Award winner. And Alan said, again, mostly when patients develop neuropathy after a, a brachial plexus block, it's not due to the technique itself, it's due to patient positioning and surgically induced stress. And that's actually consistent with what our findings were back in 05. And here's a nice paper by Admir Hazek that looked at the use of ultrasound and neural stimulation for a supraclavicular brachial plexus block. Again, the patient developed a very severe brachial plexopathy. And again, Admir has been a proponent of using both electrical stimulation in conjunction with the anatomical observations that we see with ultrasound. But even with these technologies and these techniques put together side by side in tandem, we cannot prevent nerve injury. Here's a nice picture of Adir and I in Turkey a few years ago, sailing on the Bosphorus. So what happens with ultrasound-guided techniques? Don't we prevent and minimize the intraneural injection? Or if it's intraneural, is it, um, uh, is it extrafascicular or is it intrafascicular? So here's from Paul Bigelison's group. This is a cadaver study where they were doing interscaling blocks to the brachial plexus and they were injecting India ink dye and then sectioning the cadavers, and in 50% of their interscaling blocks of the brachial plexus where they were not intentionally trying to be intraneural, they were actually intraneural. Here's another unsung hero of regional anesthesia and a great friend and colleague right here, your own Jacques Yaddo. And along with Spencer Liu, they've conducted really what I consider to be one of the most important studies looking at intraneural injections. And this, the reason why it's important is because these great thinkers, unsung heroes, they conducted preoperative, prospective neurological assessments on all 257 patients who came for interscaling blocks of the brachial plexus. And then they did their interscaling blocks under ultrasound guidance, and then they sent all the films to an independent observer, a person who was not part and parcel to the surgical procedure and was not part and parcel to the anesthetic. 
and they found that in 17%, 42 patients, or 17% of cases, when they were not intentionally trying to be intramural, they were actually intramural. Now why do I spend time talking about this? Because obviously we're trying to prevent or minimize trespass with our regional techniques in patients who are neurologically compromised. And so one stratagem would be, of course, well, get, it, get close to the nerve, but don't be intramural. And these great studies demonstrate to us that even when we're not trying to be intramural, we oftentimes, up to at least 17%, we can be intramural. How much time do I have, Chris? About 15 minutes? Now I want to really, the heart and matter, I gave you a lot of history, I gave you a lot of background. What are some of the conditions of pre-existing neuropathic uh, pain or, or pre-existing neuropathic conditions that we may be confronted with each and every day in our respective practices? I'm sure that occasionally you'll have a patient who has multiple sclerosis who comes to you in this uh, distinguished orthopedic center such as this who may need a regional anesthetic block. And of course, multiple sclerosis is a central neurological condition, not a peripheral neurological condition. So we might opine that there's no effect at all from a peripheral nerve block on patients who have pre-existing multiple sclerosis. We know that MS is a demyelinating condition. We know that it's associated with sensory and motor and visual impairment, autonomic dysfunction, bladder and bowel issues. It's a devastating condition for the unfortunate individual suffering from MS. There are hemo hemodynamic, metabolic, and temperature effects, and the neurological symptoms may worsen postoperatively, irrespective of whether or not we conduct a regional block or general anesthetic for our patients. And so if you look at what the literature shows, I just showed you a paper from Brian Seitz a few moments ago, where a patient who had MS, who underwent a peripheral nerve block, a brachial plexus block interscaling, actually had severe brachial plexopathy following the block, even though MS is a central condition. We know that there have been reports of prolonged paravertebral blocks in MS patients. And so we don't really know whether or not there's a safety factor built in for peripheral nerve injections for these pre, uh, predisposed patients. Independent prospective cohort studies have shown, however, that OB patients have done pretty well when laboring epidurals have been offered to them when they have multiple sclerosis. So dogma back in the day, back in the 80s and 90s, Angela Bader and from Harvard and other people used to say, spinal anesthetics should not be done in patients with MS because it, this may exacerbate the dysfunction and increase sensitivity to the demyelinated spinal cord areas with local anesthetics deposited in the intrathecal space or by blocking, prolonged blocking of sodium channels in the demyelinated regions of the central nervous system could cause an exacerbation or worsening of the outcome. Well, in point of fact, the most recent data, and this is from 2017, which is a large systematic review of 35 publications in 231 patients, 243 of whom received neuraxial blocks, either spinals or epidurals, demonstrated that there was no worsening of multiple sclerosis in patients who had undergone neuraxial blocks, both in, orth in uh, orthopedic surgery as well as in obstetrics. So the, the latest and greatest information would suggest, at least, that within reason in selected individuals, neuraxial techniques may be acceptable for your patients who have multiple sclerosis. What about central conditions? Conditions such as severe spinal stenosis, compre compressive radiculopathy, or in patients who have undergone prior spinal surgery. Wouldn't we tread fairly cautiously in those individuals, especially with neuraxial techniques, before undertaking them? And so it appears that spinal stenosis is indeed a risk factor about 1.1% of individuals who have severe spinal stenosis or compressive radiculopathy may have secondary neurological in, uh, injury following a neuraxial technique. This is retrospective data, but it does appear that there's a, by a factor of about 1.1% greater incidence or likelihood of sustaining uh, prolonged neurological insult. The second ASRA advisory committee from 2015 <coughs> with Joe Neal and Ricky and, and Hadzik and Hebel and others suggested that individuals who've had prior spine surgery should probably undergo some type of imaging, whether it's MRI imaging or CT scan imaging before they undergo their axial block or have the blocks performed using fluoroscopic imaging because they do, uh, even though prior spine surgery is not considered a risk factor for neurological complications, they do urge caution in approaching patients who have surgical spinal scars, and I would tend to agree with that. The next condition I want to briefly go through is diabetes. Now, obviously, you're going to be confronted each and every day in this 
distinguished hallowed institution with patients who've got type 2 and type 1 diabetes. It's a distal symmetric sensory motor polyneuropathy associated with microangiography, uh, uh, sorry, angiopathy, and an increased sensitivity to local anesthetic as well as a resistance to the use of neural stimulation to identify nerves. So what is the likelihood of a patient with pre-existing diabetes sustaining a nerve injury following regional block? We go to retrospective data from uh, uh, James Hebel and others at the Mayo Clinic, and you'll see that compared to Ricky Brohl's numbers, that the likelihood of having a sustained neuropathic process after, um, after an axial injection is about nine times higher for spinal than it is in a non-neuropathic patient, that is a patient with diabetes who gets a spinal, and about 25 times higher than Ricky Brule's data for a patient who has an epidural block if they have severe diabetes polyneuropathy. So there is some data, at least of a retrospective nature, from the Mayo Clinic, which would suggest that uh, rendering patients, uh, <coughs> placing spinal epidurals in patients with pre-existing diabetic neuropathy may be somewhat at a higher risk. These are some photomicrographs, histology of what we see with diabetic polyneuropathy. You see thickening of the endothelium, progressive sclerosis of small vessels, and this may predispose these nerves to greater injury. <clears throat> so can we use a nerve stimulator? Well, yes, but it's in many cases, <clears throat> our findings are unreliable. Some studies have shown, this is from Brian Seitz again, he had to ramp up his voltage and his uh, stimulation to greater than 2.4 milliamps, even unsuccessfully. In, uh, continuous ax axillary block catheters in 405 patients, there were two new deficits which were not related to the diabetes, and this comes from Jim Hebel's work again at the Mayo Clinic. How about chemotherapy-induced peripheral polyneuropathy? Patients obviously come to this institution and many others who have cancer. They've been undergoing chemotherapy. It appears that the drug, the dose, and the duration of the chemotherapy are the three primary factors to determine whether a patient sustains an ongoing or worsening of a neuropathic pain condition. The incidence is very high of patients having neuropathy with chemotherapy, greater than 50%, and the vast majority, two-thirds of those patients, will have a neuropathy within the first month of undergoing treatment. And one study showed about a 2.2% incidence of ongoing or worsening neurological deficits with regional anesthesia. Entrapment neuropathies, carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar nerve neuropathy, and so forth. Again, we go to the Mayo Clinic for some retrospective data. It appears that patients who sustain ongoing worsening of their neuropathic pain condition when they have an entrapment neuropathy all received blocks with bupivacaine. That takes me back to my former statement about the relative safety or lack thereof of a drug like Expiril. We simply don't know. But certainly from this Mayo Clinic retrospective data, there was a four times higher incidence of sustained neuropathic pain when patients had axillary blocks of the brachial plexus conducted and bupivacaine was the local anesthetic. Really, I'm going to fin finish in the next three minutes here talking about some hereditary conditions. These are rare conditions especially hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies. It's a genetic mutation where there's a deletion of chromosome 17P11.2. Now that number doesn't mean much to any of us in this room, but it's an important number because we see in this condition a deletion of the chromosome, and in a related condition, Charcot-Marie tooth condition, we see a duplication at the same level. So the 17P11.2 chromosome, which encodes for myelin sheath and myelin protein production is a very, very important chromosome. Patients with HMPP develop temaculas. What's a temacula? It's a sausage-shaped swelling around the nerve. It seems intuitive and inferential that if you have ultrasound, you should be able to see a temacula. I've never seen one. I don't know if you guys have seen temaculas. This is what Charcot-Marie tooth looks like, of which there are multiple uh, iterations of that condition, which also has swelling around the nerve. And this predisposes patients to post-operative and post-procedural neuropathy. HNPP patients are prone to the development of schwannomas. A schwannoma is a tumor of myelin or tooth. Thanks, Bill. Good job, man. <laughs> patients who have HNPP are prone to the development of pressure palsies. There's case reports of acute brachial plexopathy or lover's palsy neuropathy in patients having breast surgery under general anesthesia. And we don't know, again, whether regional anesthesia conducted under ultrasound will be uh, salubrious or not, but it's in inferential and intuitive that if we could see these aberrations of the nerve, we might be able to avoid them. This is what a schwannoma looks like. It's a large tumor of the nerve sheath. It's the most common type of benign tumor that we see in peripheral nerves. 
The final discussion I'm having now, and I'll, and I'll, be, I'll shut up, Chris, I promise. The most common type of hereditary peripheral neuropathy is Charcot-Marie Tooth, and there are several iterations of this condition. And once again, whereas we see PNP22 uh, uh, deletions with uh, HNPP, we see duplication at the same gene, 17P11.2, which accounts for greater than 50% of these cases. The use of peripheral neural stimulation, these patients are resistant to nerve stimulation for identifying nerves, and they may be ideal candidates. We don't know that for the use of ultrasound guidance. This is what the lesion looks like in Charcot-Marie Tooth. There's a reduction in myelinated fiber density, hypermyelination, as well as demyelination, and this so-called onion bulb formation. We see that right over here in peripheral nerves in patients who have Charcot-Marie Tooth. So, in summary and conclusions, we have no absolute method. There are no guidelines for how to manage patients. This is really an unmet need, which I'm expecting the young uh, viral minds, of, uh, I should say, the great minds here at HSS to come forth and, and deliver to us some guidelines for how to manage patients with pre-existing neuropathic conditions. We don't know how patients are going to respond to regional block, whether they be central neuraxial blocks or peripheral uh, neuraxial blocks, whether the neuropathy will remain static or become exacerbated, and of course, it's so important to document everything. I, and I teach this to my residents. I'm sure you have the same dogma here. You must document each and every pre-existing neuropathic condition. If you have, or the patient has, has had studies such as EMG and nerve conduction velocity, it's imperative that you uh, document these conditions. Ultrasound guidance is not protected. We've seen that. Your own people here showed that in 17% of interscaling block cases, when you're not intentionally trying to be intraneural, you get intraneural. Early EMG is important, why? If a patient presents after surgery, they complain to their surgeon or back to the anesthesia department, fibrillation potentials don't develop for two to three weeks in a new onset nerve injury. So if the patient has uh, an injury and you send them for an EMG within the first week or two and they have fibrillation potentials, this implies that they had a pre-existing condition. So it's really important to get a baseline EMG in somebody who presents with some new onset sensory or motor dysfunction. And as my great mentor, we talked about this at dinner last night, was very, right Seth? The talk was very fond of saying when there are problems with any regional anesthetic technique, look for the cause first on the proximal end of the needle. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope this has been entertaining. And <laughs>
as all neuropraxias do, is, is about 99% within the first six months. And so we send patients for physiotherapy, we manage them, we document everything, and we give them gabapentin. Most patients do extremely well with that regimen. And can you make an argument for just, for not doing the workup and just tell them, that let's wait this out? Because it seems like that's yeah. what we do around here could. a lot of times is, is not send them for an aggressive workup uh, and just say, let's wait this out for a few weeks. I would absolutely c concur, because we know, especially with the sensory nerve, I mean, you know, you, you've got all these nerves in the foot, there are, there are, there are six nerves, or seven or eight nerves that you have to be responsible for in the foot and ankle, and the sural nerve is always sent as purely sensory, and the saphenous nerve is purely sensory. If they have a sural nerve issue or a saphenous nerve issue, we just wait it out. If there's a motor component, I think the motor component is a little bit more egregious and a little bit more resistant. And I would absolutely recommend having a consultation with a neurologist. But again, you know, things happen for a reason. And Seddon and then Sidney Sunderland, who came a few years after Seddon, really pinned this down. And I, rec I really recommend to those who are fellows or who are in training, go and study the work of Seddon, S-E-D-D-O-N, and go and get a copy of Sutter Sunderland's book, because it really defines the history and the course of, of neuropraxia and the history and the course of axonotmesis and the history and the course of neurotmesis, because you really need to know which condition it is that defines what the outcome is going to be. Uh, Phil, last question. Yes. Um, in your opinion, is intraneural injection of local anesthetic uh, a dangerous thing? Well, you could be intraneural and extrafascicular, or you could be intraneural and intrafascicular. We'll break those down as far as what you think the risk is. You know, I think that intraneural extrafascicular is not a dangerous thing, and there's some, there's some great studies. When you look at the onset of a local anesthetic block with an intraneural extrafascicular injection. I mean, it's, it's on the, people are doing interscaling blocks with 1 ml or 1.5 ml and 3 mls, and there's a lot of great literature that's come from Admir and other people that nerve injury is, is a function of predisposed nerves, high injection pressures, and large volumes. So I think if you're doing an intraneural injection extrafascicular with very small volumes and low injection pressures, that's probably not risky for the patient. In a predisposed patient, however, any intraneural injection can be potentially harmful or toxic. Uh, and I think certainly injecting larger volumes or under high pressure. What pressure is that? Is it 20 pounds per square inch? You know, Adrian did all these studies in Sarajevo in dogs and dogs and, and tried to quantify which pressure was the one most likely. For me, I try to stay, I don't try to be intraneural if I can help it. But as Spencer and Jacques showed us, even when you're not trying, and, in, in one out of uh, five or one out of six cases, you'll be intraneural if you're doing the block correctly. I try to stay extraneural, but if you're intraneural and you're extrafascicular, I don't believe that that's harmful. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.